What is up, y'all? It's Afni here, and welcome back to Seriously, What the Frick? So, I got this new thing I'm starting today, and I think I eventually settled on calling it Fricked History. I really want to call it Fucked History, but I, fe- I feel like Fricked goes a little bit more with the podcast name than Fucked. Granted, the podcast, as I said multiple times, is technically called Seriously, What the Fuck, but we all know why I couldn't do that. Anyway, since this thing is called Seriously, What the Frick... And I talk about things that make you go, like, seriously, like, what the frick, like, that had actually happened. And that does include a lot more than just true crime that involves shitty things that has happened in the past. And unfortunately, that does entail school shootings. And I thought I would start off with that. Just why not? Just go right into the taboo, just right into something that while writing made me uncomfortable and I didn't realize how uncomfortable of a topic (laughs) this kind of I mean don't get like I knew it was a very bad one okay not bad but like I I knew that it was definitely very taboo to talk about and not a lot of people talk about them especially in like podcasts this is what happened form so um I just wanted to be different I wanted to not be like those other girls And I decided to go with one of the more famous school shootings, because why the fuck not? I'm trying to save my ass, because I don't really know how, like, people are gonna take this episode. I'm I'm actually scared to do it, but I put in, like, a week of worth into into, getting information for it, so I might as well just do it. Anyway, this week we are going to be talking about the Columbine High School Massacre. Okay, a few things before I get started. Nothing to do with the actual episode, kind of. So, um, one, that intro still gives me the creeps. Um, and it's one o'clock in the afternoon. And I just woke up, so that's why my voice is a little off. It, 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 it will clear up by the time that I'm, I'm done with this episode, I promise. Um, two, three? I, mean, I don't know how to count. Um, this episode is not going to be as lighthearted and has a not as many jokes as my other episodes do, solely just because this is a very taboo topic. I do talk about things that I would normally never talk about. I do get very graphic. I do say some words that as a white person and as a, well, now I'm part of the LGBTQ community, so, but I'm still not really allowed to say it. They're very, I, it, this, this podcast is very taboo and it's very dark, even for me. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's heavy. This episode is very heavy. So I try to, do what I can, but I am also trying to be super respectful because I feel like in this sense, like, I wasn't able to say as many things as I wanted to say solely just because of how heavy this topic is. And it just, it hits different in a bad way. So, fair warning, this is not gonna be, I think, as funny as my other episodes are gonna be. I do try to make it as lighthearted as possible, but it's just hard because I don't know how people are going to take it. This this topic's very hard for a lot of people. I think almost for everyone. So I'm trying my best, but also there's also just, just like a lot of information about it too. So in order to save me talking and having you guys have like a 13 hour episode, um, I won't be making as many comments or as many like weird funny offhand jokes as I normally would just to be respectful because I feel like if I were to make a joke I feel like it would come off a lot more disrespectful um that I'd mean it so we're not gonna do that today and I'm gonna stop talking (laughs) and I'm gonna actually talk more about the episode now I'm I'm gonna get started I'm I'm just getting started now So, like normal, I am going to start off with a little bit of background information on the teens that did this whole thing, I guess. Eric David Harris was born April 9th, 1981 in Wichita, Kansas. The family moved around a lot because his father, who was an Air Force transport pilot, 
had to move around a lot because of his job. They eventually moved to Littleton, Colorado in July of 1993, where his dad eventually retired from the U.S. Air Force. And Eric went to Can Carroll Middle School, and that's where he met his buddy and fellow shooter, Dylan Klebold. Dylan Klebold was born September 11th, 1981, and was born in Lakewood, Colorado, and he was raised in a very Lutheran family. Dylan was named after the playwright Dylan Thomas, who wrote the poems Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Just a little fun fact about him, I guess. And as I mentioned before, Dylan went to Ken Carroll Middle School, where he met Eric, and they kind of just became buddies. In 1996, 15-year-old Eric had made a private website on AOL, which stands for America Online, just in case y'all wanted to know that. Um, and it was to host levels for the first-person shooter game Doom in Doom 2, and sometimes the game Quake. Eric then began to make a blog on the site like it was his own personal diary. Eric would talk about topics about him stinking out of his house, lighting fireworks, causing vandalism to appear, which made no sense. He would vandalize things, and he would do this with Dylan and a few other friends. By 1997, the blog did transform from being about teens doing asshole teen things to Eric just being really angry at the world and against society specifically. By the end of the same year, Eric had posted instructions on how to make explosives. The site did have very few visitors, and the site wasn't exactly harmful until about August of 1997. Eric ended up making a post about his murder's fantasies in detail, saying, quote, All I want to do is kill and injure as many of you as I can, especially a few people like Brooks Browns, end quote. Brooks Browns was a classmate of Eric's. And Brooks' parents did see this post, and they did call the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, and the investigator did write a, dra a draft affidavit to get a search warrant for Eric's house, but it never got submitted to a judge, so a search never happened. On January 30th of 1998, the two boys were arrested for breaking into a white van and stealing tools and computer equipment. They did attend a joint court hearing, and they did plead guilty to felony theft. The judge sentenced them to juvenile diversion program, and they both attended these very mandatory anger management classes. They both left the program early due to, quote, positive actions, and they were both put on probation. After being arrested and dealing with all of that ish I just mentioned, Eric did change his website from being edgy and hateful, you know, just all that edgy, hateful things, to just hosting games again. It was just a server, pretty much. But that didn't mean that he was all better now. Eric began writing in journals. He did have multiple of them. And in these journals, Eric and Dylan would eventually begin to plan the attack on their high school. But I'll get to that in a few minutes. In these journals, Eric would talk a lot about his fantasies of raping and torturing women in his bedroom. And he said that he would like to dismember women and then have sex with the corpse. Eric also mentioned that he wanted to dabble a little bit into and cannibalism, too. Dylan had kept journals since March of 1997, and he mentions as early as November of 1997 going on a killing spree and what he would wear during the attack. Eric and Dylan also used their schoolwork to foreshadow their attack. Whenever it came to creative writing assignments, they would often talk about talk or have them themes of violence. In December of 1997, Eric wrote a paper on school shootings titled, quote, Guns in School. Then he wrote a poem from the perspective of a bullet. Dylan wrote a short story about a man killing students. And I guess the story was either super graphic or just the overall plot was scary. Probably both. Regardless, the story disturbed his teacher so much that she actually called his parents. Roughly a year before the attack, Dylan wrote a little message, I guess, in Eric's 1998 yearbook saying, quote, Killing enemies, blowing up stuff, killing cops. My wrath for January's incident will be godlike. Not to mention our revenge in the commons, end quote. And the commons is what they called the cafeteria. So he just wrote that, that paragraph in a yearbook, I guess, for funsies. Eric and Dylan were both part of video protection classes, and they kept about five videotapes that they made with school equipment. 
one, only two of these uh, tapes were ever released. The tapes are called Hitman and Rampart Range. I don't, I don't know. Um, there was a third that was partially released called Radioactive Clothing, um, but none of the other tapes were ever released. Most of these tapes were filmed in Eric's basement, and these were called the basement tapes because they were made in Eric's basement. And these tapes have details of their plans and their reasoning behind the upcoming horrific thing that they'll eventually do. There's also this tape called the Nixon tape, where Eric had left a micro cassette that was labeled Nixon, and it left on the kitchen table. Eric said it was, quote, less than nine hours now. People will die because of me. It will be a day that they'll remember forever, end quote. And that was on the tape. April 20th of 1999, it was a Tuesday morning in Littleton, Colorado. Which, I didn't mention this earlier, I'm like pretty sure it's a suburb of Denver, because my mom lived in Littleton for a little bit and was actually supposed to go to Columbine High School for, um, around this time. Thank God she didn't. Um, if she was there at the correct time, I probably wouldn't be here talking to y'all right now. I mean, I, I, would, I would hope so, but... D- I, anyway, it's 420, 1999, right? And when Eric and Dylan go to the cafeteria and they place two duffel bags... And in these duffel bags were propane bombs, which they had converted eight propane tanks into kablooies over the past weekend. Earlier in the morning, around 9.12 a.m., Eric was caught on camera at a Texaco gas station buying a blue rhino propane tank. And in the cafeteria, they they planted a single 20-pound tank, pipe bombs, and gasoline canisters. Propane bombs were set to go off at lunch A, which started at 11.15 a.m. No one remembers seeing the duffel bags being put in the actual cafeteria. There was like 400 plus backpacks everywhere too. So I don't think many, if anyone, would really notice them. Also, I don't know if Eric and Dylan had actually gotten lucky or they really knew the school. So there was a... God, my voice is not coming. I don't know what's happening. So there was a tape change for the camera system that was done at 11.14 a.m. right before lunch A started. And the custodian who was changing the tape didn't see anything being placed before the tape change. There are some internet sleuths out there believe that the bombs can be seen being placed at 10.58 a.m., but what we do know for sure is that they were just in normal, everyday clothes when they put the duffel bags in the commons. I'm just going to call it the commons because I like it, and I mean, I'm going to use commons and cafeteria pretty interchangeably, but uh, cafeterias are dumb, and I just, the commons just sounds kind of badass, so whatever. From my understanding, the reason that they wanted to bomb the commons so badly was mostly because the cafeteria had a very long outside window slash wall thing. It was pretty much a wall made out of glass that was used as a window. Um, and they had ground level doors and it was a little north of the senior parking and then the library above the commons was in the second story um, also with the giant wall window thing I don't know why the architects really thought that they really needed to see where they parked but okay but it was because there was bombs in their cars as well you know to do some real damage to the 70 and 80 cars the teens were driving back then I don't really know. I think it was just like the window and just because the library was right above them and they wanted to just bomb the commons. And I, something happened in the common area, which I will uh, talk about way later. So I, I don't really know. I, as I'm saying it out loud, it kind of makes no sense, but uh, I'm going to move on. So Eric and Dylan both had bombs in their car. They were two 20-pound propane tanks, um, pipe bombs, and a whole bunch of containers that were filled with gasoline. Eight pot- pipe bombs were in Dylan's car, and only one was in Eric's. The teens ended up placing two backpacks filled with pipe bombs, aerosol containers, and small propane tanks in a field about three miles away from the high school, or 4.8 kilometers. And that was about two miles away, or 3.2 kilometers, away from the nearby uh, fire station. These bombs were supposed to be a diversion to draw away firefighters and just emergency people away from the school. But one of the bombs went off and it caused a small fire, as a bomb would do, but it was very quickly uh, extinguished by the fire department. 
Eric and Dylan went to then change clothes, and then they drove separately to school. Eric parked in the junior student parking, and the Dylan parked in the senior parking area. As Eric was pulling into the parking lot, he kind of just ran into Brooks Brown. If you remember, he was the dude that Eric wanted to kill and got, like, the cops called on him for that. Uh, that guy. But he runs into him. They had recently started getting along. They kind of just figured out some sort of friendship. They patched up what was ever between them. And this is according to Brooks, but as he was smoking, he said that he was just surprised to see Eric because Brooks had noticed that Eric wasn't in class for a test that they had that day. And Brooks goes up to Eric and was like, what the hell, man? Like, you must have test. And Eric didn't seem like he really, he didn't really give a fuck and kind of just went, quote, it doesn't matter anymore. Brooks, I like you now. Get out of here. Go home. End quote. Brooks did get that feeling that maybe, like, he got, like, the feeling of, like, hey, maybe I should listen to this guy. And Brooks was already planning on skipping his next class, so he just said, okay, and he walked away from the school. After this interaction, Eric and Dylan began arming themselves. They used straps and webbing to hide their weapons under their black trench coats. Eric also had a bandolier, which is, like, the belt that, like, only badasses and Western people wore, or, like, Chewbacca. It's the belt, but for, like, ammo, where it crosses over each other and you're just able to take, like, a round out of your armpit. So Eric was wearing that. And Dylan was wearing a white t-shirt that said Natural Selection. They took the backpack and duffel bags. There were so many backpacks and duffel bags. They took more du backpacks and duffel bags that were filled with pipe bombs, ammo, and Eric had actually put one of his shotguns in one of the bags, too. At 11.19 a.m. is when the shooting began. 17-year-old Rachel Scott and her buddy Richard Castiato were having lunch just hanging out in the grassy area that was by one of the entrances of the school. Dylan had thrown a pipe bomb towards the parking lot, but it didn't go completely off, so it kind of just made a bunch of smoke. Also, side note, these pipe bombs had shrapnel parts in them, and Eric's website, if you remember, did have the directions to make a pipe bomb. Eric had put in his journal that there was a total of 25 pipe bombs that were created. But Richard and Rachel had completely thought there was, like, some weird senior prank. Again, like, it was maybe three weeks before the end of their senior year, so they just thought, like, hey, you know, it's time for pranks, whatever. You know, and they decided it was some weird prank that they ha were just happening to see unfold. And a lot of students had thought this during the first pipe bomb, since it did not go off all the way. A bunch of people said that they heard the words, quote, go, go, end quote, before Eric and Dylan pulled out their guns from their trench coats and began to shoot. Rachel was killed instantly when she was shot four times by Eric and one shot was directly in her temple. Richard was shot eight times in the chest, arms, and abdomen. He did go unconscious, but he did survive. He was left paralyzed from below the chest. Eric aimed his high point 995 carbine at one of the staircases in the direction of Daniel Robro, Sean Graves, and Lance Kirkland. These three at first totally thought these were paintball guns and they were planning on walking up the stairs where Dylan and Eric were. Eric ends up firing and ends up killing Daniel and manages to injure Sean and Lance. By this time, obviously people are hearing shooting and this teacher, William David Sanders, who went by a day, so I will be calling him as such, began to warn students. Dylan and Eric had just then turned and started to shoot towards another five students that were just hanging out on a hill. Michael Johnson was hit in the face, leg, and arm, but was able to run and escape. Mark Taylor was shot in the chest, arms, and leg uh, pretty bad and fell to the ground and played fake dead. And then the other three students managed to escape completely okay and they were not harmed. Dylan walks down the steps where he just shot Lance and Daniel, and he goes to Lance, who is now pleading for help and lying on the ground, and he does call out to Dylan to help him. And Dylan says, quote, sure, I'll help you, end quote, and then shot Lance in the face with a shotgun. But he does end up surviving some fucking how, how you survive a shotgun almost point blank, I'm assuming, to the face is crazy, but he did end up surviving. Sean, at this point, is now paralyzed from the waist down and starts to crawl to one of the doorways, and he ends up collapsing before he gets there. He does rub his face in, um, he does rub blood on his face, and then he played dead. After Dylan was done shooting Lance in the face, Sean remembers Dylan saying, quote, sorry, dude, as he was stepping over Sean to get into the commons. 
Dylan kind of just entered the commons, but he didn't shoot anyone inside. It was speculated that he was just checking in the bombs, which never went off. Because if they did at full power, the library would have fallen into the cafeteria and would have either killed or severely injured the 488 students that were inside that part of the building. So it's really fortunate that these two teenagers were really bad at making bombs. Why do I say bombs like that? Bombs? That's weird. I'm not. That's weird. Anyway. So Dylan comes out of the comments and just goes right back to Eric, who was still on the stairs where Lance, Daniel, and Sean were shot. He And Eric was just going off. He was shooting a lot. He did severely injure a lot of people and ended up only partializing, uh, partialized, paralyzing 17-year-old Anne-Marie Hulk Halter. Which that's really fun to say. Hulk Halter. I love that name. They begin to shoot students that were a little close to the soccer field, but didn't hit anybody. They start to walk up towards the west entrance, and they began to throw pipe bombs in every direction they could think of. One on the roof included, but only a few ended up going off. Someone did recall one of them saying, quote, This is what we always wanted to do. This is awesome. End quote. While all of that is going on, the art teacher Patty Nielsen was inside the school, and I'm pretty sure this was all I'm saying was outside of school because they were outside when she went to go do this. But she was hearing all of this commotion, and she and another student named Brian Anderson had planned to walk up to the two students shooting up the place to tell them to, quote, knock it off. Because they thought they were shooting some sort of film or just doing some elaborate loud prank. Brian opened the doors, and Dylan and Eric end up shooting out the windows. Brian did get hit with glass, and the art teacher, Patty, was hit with some shrapnel in the shoulder. They immediately run down the hall into the library, and Patty tells the students that were inside the library that people are shooting to get under the desk and to keep quiet as possible. Patty then calls 911 and it hides under the library's admin counter. And from the transcripts from the police department, Patty's call was received at 11.25 a.m. 11.22 a.m. A custodian had called Deputy Neil Garter, who um, was the resource officer for Columbine, and the custodian had radioed the deputy for help in the senior parking lot, I'm assuming just because of the smoke from the pipe bomb that Dylan threw earlier. I think it was Dylan. I can't remember now. I'm assuming that's what that was. And at 11.23 a.m., Neil heard on his radio that a female was down, and they kind of just assumed that she was hit by a car. By the time he got out of his patrol car in the senior parking lot at 11.24 a.m., over the school radio, someone said, quote, Neil, there's a shooter in the school, end quote. Two motorcycle policemen deputies, Paul Smoke and Paul Bagger, so I'm going to be calling them Smoke and Bagger um, because they're both named Paul, were riding traffic tickets just north of the school when they heard the female down call. They took the shortest route and drove their motorcycles over the grass between the fields and headed towards the west entrance. I'm assuming the west entrance was almost pretty much the main entrance to the school. Then they see deputies Scott Tabowski, Rick Cyril, and Kevin Walker following them in their patrol car. Smoke and Major just cut. Magger. That autocorrected to Major. Mag. Magger. I don't even know how he said his name. I'm so sorry. Then just leave their motorcycles to get into the patrol car. Sorry, I have, like, uh, paragraphs of what information I need to, like, say. So, um, I guess I'll correct uh, Maggard to Major, and I'm sorry about that. I wasn't paying attention. So at 11.26 a.m., Eric is still in the west entrance and begins to shoot 10 rounds at Neil, who is about 60 yards or 55 uh, meters away. Since Eric's carbine can only hold about 10 round mags, he had to reload, and while he was doing that, Neil ends up shooting four times from his service weapon at Eric, from over the top of his patrol car. Eric then ducks behind the building, and Neil does believe for a second, just a little second, that he actually ended up here hitting Eric. Eric then returns at least four more rounds at Neil before running back into the building. The other deputies were helping, the two, uh, helping out two other injured students from the field when they heard gunfights. No one was injured during that exchange. Neil then reports on his police radio, quote, shots in the building, I need someone in the south lot with me, end quote. By this time, Eric had shot 47 rounds and Dylan at five. The two walk inside the building for, uh, through the west entrance and move into the main north hallway, throwing pipe bombs and firing at everyone they saw. 
Dylan shoots Stephanie Munson in the ankle, but she was able to walk out of sight of the school. Out of the school. And these two assholes, which I feel like I'm allowed to call them that, um, end up shooting out the windows in the east entrance of the school, and then they went back into the hallway, and then just went back and forth shooting any, t- you know, towards any student that they saw. And I'm pretty sure they missed, like, almost every time. While all of that was going on inside the commons, Dave Sanders, Jay Gallantine, and John Curtis, who were both custodians, uh, told students to get under the tables, did end up getting the students evacuated up the stairs that led to the second floor of the school where the library is. Dave then tries to secure as th- the school as much as he possibly could. And I'm thinking maybe it was just him locking doors to the classrooms, just areas, just making sure that there was no lingering students who kind of just got stuck. I don't know quite for sure what he was doing, but um, he was securing the school, according to my source for this part. So Dave and another student were at the end of the hallway, and they walked past the library, and Dave gestures at the students in the library to stay put. They ended up running into Eric and Dylan, and Dave and the other student did run in opposite directions. Eric and Dylan both shot at them. Eric ended up hitting Dave twice in the back and neck with bullets. He shot him. I just realized that I was supposed to say that. Dave is now shot. And while Dave is falling, he ended up hitting his teeth on the exit door. But the other student ended up being okay. They were not shot. The other student, I don't know who it was, he ends up running into a science classroom and warned everyone to hide. Dylan is now walking over to Dave, who is now laying on the ground, and Dylan tossed a pipe bomb at him, and he meets up with Eric in the hall in the library hallway. Dave is now struggling to get towards the science area, and another teacher got him into a classroom where 30 students were located. Student Aaron Hansey, who was brought in by other teachers to help out Dave, since Aaron just had this ultimate knowledge of first aid. So despite everything going on around them and how horrible that could have ended, they do sneak out Aaron from another classroom to go and help out another teacher, which is super nice. It's really nice. Aaron did help out Dave with the help of another student named Kevin Starkley and another teacher, Teresa Miller. Aaron was helping out Dave. I keep on saying Aaron was helping out Dave. Aaron helped out Dave for about three hours. He was using t-shirts from other students in the classroom to help keep Dave... Um, from losing too much blood. And they even had the idea of having Dave tell the kids about the pictures in his wallet to keep him talking, alert, and also just to kind of help him not just focus on the bullet that was inside his neck and back. Teresa and other students did use the phone in the in the room to keep in contact with the police outside of the school. By the time Dave had gotten into the science classroom, Dylan and Eric were now inside of the library. 11.29 a.m. Eric and Dylan had gotten to the library where there were 52 students, two teachers, and two librarians inside. Eric had fired his shotgun twice at a desk where a student named Evan Todd was hit by wood splinters from the desk in the eye and the lower back. But besides that, he was okay. He then runs and hides behind the admin counter. These two a-holes then begin to walk to the two rows of computers. Sitting in the upper row was 16-year-old Kyle Velasquez, who was actually disabled. Eric fires his his shotgun at Kyle and hits him in the head and back. After that, Eric and Dylan put down their duffel bags that were full of ammo and reload and begin to walk between the computer rows towards the windows. They had told everybody to get up and that the library was going to explode and how long they had been waiting for this to happen. And they would yell Yahoo after shooting at their peers. The two had ordered the jocks, quote unquote, I literally hate that word, the jocks, to stand up. Um, and we don't quite know whether if it was Dylan or Eric who said this, but one of them did say, quote, anybody with a white hat or a sports emblem on it is dead, end quote. And wearing a white hat was kind of tradition for any student that played sports at Columbine. Nobody stood up, and anyone that was wearing a white hat or any sort of sports emblem did try to hide theirs in order to live. Outside of the windows, you could see that more cops had arrived, and Dylan and Eric had shot the windows in the direction of the new police officers, and one officer did return fire, but no one was hurt. Dylan then removed his trench coat and shot his shotgun at a nearby table, and injured students Patrick Ireland, Daniel Steepton, and Mackay Hall. Eric then walked over to the lower row of computers and fired his shotgun under the desk at 14-year-old Stephen Kernow, who was hit in the neck. 
He then moves to a desk that was adjacent to Stevens and injured 17-year-old Casey Rusiger with a shot that went through her shoulder and grazed her neck. And this did hit a severe major artery, and while she was gasping for air and was clearly in pain, Eric just said to her, quit, uh, quote, quit your bitching. Eric then walks um, to another computer table with student 17-year-old Cassie Bernal and Emily Wyatt. Eric then slapped the top of the desk and said, quote, peekaboo, before shooting Cassie in the head with his shotgun. He held his shotgun with one hand because, um, and you know, because of the recoil, he hit himself in the nose and it kind of fucked him up a little bit. And he runs over to Dylan and he was like, look what I did. Like, I, I hit myself with my shotgun. And Dylan kind of just looked at him and said, quote, why'd you do that? End quote. After this interaction, Dylan then turns, um, turn and went to the next table. His nose is bleeding at this point. Some people saying, like, saying it was around his mouth. And, you know, if that image isn't horrifying enough, he asked his student named Pri Pascali if she wanted to die. And naturally, Pri was like, not really. And she pleads for her life. Eric then laughs and said, quote, everyone's gonna die, end quote. Dylan tells Eric to, quote, shoot her, but then Eric just said, quote, no, we're going to blow up the school anyway, end quote. Dylan then noticed that Patrick Ireland was trying to give some aid to Mackay Hall, who had gotten a wound to his knee from when Dylan had shot at the desk. When Patrick was trying to help, he had risen his head over the table and Dylan shot him a second time. He was hit twice in the head and once in the foot, and he went unconscious. Dylan then walked to another table where he sees 18-year-old Isaiah Scholes, 16-year-old uh, Matthew Ketcher, and 16-year-old Craig Scott, who was actually Rachel Scott's younger brother. Uh, she was the first one to be shot. And these three were hiding under a table. Dylan then calls out to Eric that he found, quote, a nigger, and then tried to pull Isaiah out from the table. I warned you guys before y'all even did. It's, it's, it, I warned you before I even started. I do say some things I should not be saying, but as an educator and uh, really fucked up things that happened in the world, I don't like to censor things, and I I just d d d don't come after me. Okay, I don't like to censor things, and it's what he said. It is a quote, so I don't feel comfortable saying it. I really don't, but um, I gotta do what I gotta do for the um. For the podcast, please don't make that out of context to make it seem like I'm racist. Please don't, because I'm not, I promise. I'm going to move on now so I can feel a little bit less uncomfortable. Um, so Eric, at this point, had left Bree alone and went to go join his buddy Dylan. And according to some students there, they were taunting Isaiah for a few seconds and were making horrible racial comments towards him. Dylan and Eric then fired on the table, and Eric ended up shooting Isaiah once in the chest, and Dylan ends up shooting Matthew. Dylan then just says, quote, I didn't know black brains can fly that far, end quote. Even though I just said Isaiah was shot in the chest, down the head, I think Dylan was just kind of waiting, to, he was just waiting to say that at some point, and he kind of just took the opportunity, which, um, this, this whole thing sucks. That's like the best guess of why he, I think he would say that. I don't know. Craig was okay, but it was now next to the bodies of his friends. Eric then yelled, quote, who's ready to die next, end quote. He then throws a cricket, not like the bug, it was like a bomb sort of thing, and he throws it to where Mackay, Patrick, and Daniel were. It lands on Daniel's side, and Mackay quickly throws it behind him, where they just... It, but he, so Mackay sees the bomb when it lands on Daniel's thigh. He picks it up, and he tosses it behind him, and it exploded in midair. After this... Uh, Eric, for some reason, then just decides to walk to one of the bookcases and he jumped on top of it and started to shake it. And I guess he was trying to have it like fall over. I think he was trying to knock over a bookshelf or something. But in the rage of his failed attempt to knock down a bookcase, he just shot at the books that fell out of the said bookcase. Dylan then walks up to Eric, and I think Eric is still pissed at these books because he shot at a display case that was next to one of the doors, and then he shot at the closest table. Eric does end up hitting 17-year-old Mark Kitkin in the head and shoulder. He then turns to his left and shoots at 18-year-olds Lisa Krutz, Lauren Townsend, and Van Lien Schnur. He hits three students with the same blast. Dylan then moves towards the same table and fires multiple shots with a Tech 9 semi-auto pistol and ends up killing Lauren. 
Valine, who is now injured, began to scream, quote, oh my god, oh my god, end quote. Dylan then asked her if she believed in God, and Valine said that she did. And she was asked, quote, why? God is gay, end quote. He then just reloads and walks away. Eric goes to another table where two girls are hiding, bent down to look at them, and just says, quote, pathetic, and then walks away to another table where 16-year-old Nicole Nowlin and John Tomal were at. John moved out from under the desk, from from under the table, excuse me, and Dylan shot him repeatedly. Eric, Eric now walks over to the other side of where Lauren Townsend is now lying dead. And behind the table was 16-year-old Kelly Fleming, who was next to the table instead of under it because there was no space. There's a total of 56 people in this library, so there was not a lot of space. Eric shot Kelly in the back. He then shot at the table behind them, hit Lauren again, hit Lisa Kreutz again, and then ended up hitting an 18-year-old Jenna Park. Sorry, Daphne can't read numbers right now. Eric and Dylan then moved to the center of the library again to reload. Eric then points his carbine under a table, but the student had moved out of the way. Eric finds the student again and then points the gun at the same student and told him to tell him who he was. He says, I'm John Savage. Probably, I don't know. John was a buddy and an acquaintance of Dylan's. John had asked Dylan what they were doing, and Dylan just shrugged and said, quote, Oh, just killing people, end quote. <laughs> okay. John then asked if they were going to kill him. Dylan said, what? And then John asked again if they were going to kill him. There was a fire alarm that was going on during all of this, and according to my sources, so the what was probably just Dylan genuinely not hearing John as, um, not hearing what John had asked. But Dylan did say no and told John to run. He did. John ran through the library's main entrance. After John leaves, Eric then turns and shoots his carbine at a table and hit 15-year-old Daniel Monster in the hand and ear. However, uh, Daniel reacted to being, like, so how, so how Daniel reacted to being shot was he either shoved a chair at Eric or he grabbed his leg. Um, I'm not quite sure. I don't think everyone was really paying attention. Eric then shot Daniel again in the face at almost point blank range. Dylan and Eric are now moving and shot under another table. They did end up injuring 17 year olds at Jennifer Doyle, Austin Eubanks, and Corey DePooter. By this time, it was 11.35 a.m. This is all happening in a very short amount of time, by the way. I know it seems super long for us, but it was maybe like, it was six minutes for them at this time, you know, which is a very long time to be in the same room with someone as a gun, um, as someone with a gun. But no, this is very, this is happening in a very short time span. They weren't even in the library for 10 minutes and they had ended up killing 10 people and injuring 12. Dylan is quoted um, as to saying to Eric, maybe they should start knifing people, but they never ended up doing that. They head towards the library main counter, throw a Molotov cocktail at the end of the library, but it did not go off. Dylan then pulled a chair out from under the desk where he found Evan Todd, who was injured from the splinters from the desk they had first shot. Dylan then points his tech nine at Evan, who was wearing a white hat. Dylan then asked if he was a jock. Evan said no, and Dylan said, quote, well, that's good, we don't like jocks. Dylan then demanded to see his face, and Evan kind of just raised the hat a little bit, but not enough for Dylan to see, um, to actually see his face. Evan was then asked to give Dylan one reason why they shouldn't kill him. Evan said, quote, I don't want any trouble. And that pissed off Dylan, and he was like, trouble? You don't even know what trouble is. Evan then tried to correct himself by saying, quote, that's not what I meant. I mean, I don't have a problem with you guys. I never will, and I never did. Dylan then told Eric that he was going to let Evan live, but Eric could kill him if he wanted to. Eric didn't really care and just said, quote, let's go to the commons. Dylan did fire one shot at the open library, um, into the, um, staff, at the library staff break room that was open and he ended up hitting one small TV. Eric began to walk away when Dylan said, quote, one more thing. He then picks up a chair and then slammed the chair on top of the computer terminal and the library counter. Eric then runs to where Eric, uh, excuse me, Dylan then runs to where Eric is at the library, um, and they walk out at 11.36 a.m. The 10 injured and 29 uninjured survivor, um, survivors did begin to evacuate the library because they were horrified that Eric and Dylan would come back. Casey, who was shot through the shoulder and grazed neck, um, the one that was told to, quote, uh, quit her bitching, um, for being shot, Um, That Casey, she was helped by Greg Scott, and it's reported that if she wasn't helped then, she would have most likely have bled to death. 
Patrick Ireland was still unconscious and Lisa Kurtz was unable to move and had stayed in the building. Patty Nelson, the art teacher that was trying to tell Eric and Dylan to knock it off before she had realized what was going on, had actually crawled into the break room, the break room and hid in a cabinet. After leaving the library, Eric and Dylan went into the science area where they made a fire in an empty storage closet, but it was then extinguished by a teacher who was hiding in another room. The two then go into the south hallway and they shot into an empty science room. At 11.44 a.m., they reconned the security cameras as they went back into the commons. On the security tapes, it shows Eric kneeling in the landing and firing one shot towards the propane bombs that they had put into the cafeteria. And this was their very unsuccessful attempt to blow up the place. Dylan then went to the propane bomb to look at it and see why it wasn't going kablooey, and then lit a Molotov and then threw it at the propane bomb. But a minute later, the gallon of gasoline attached to the bomb did ignite, but the fire was quickly extinguished by the school sprinkler system a few minutes later. They had left the cafeteria by 11.46 a.m. After leaving, they went into the main hallway, fired a bunch of shots into walls and ceilings, then they walked through the south hallway into the main office before going back to the main hallway. At 11.56 a.m., they went back into the cafeteria where they it went into the kitchen for a few minutes and then went up the staircase to the south hallway again at 12 p.m. At this time, SWAT had arrived and there was ambulances that began to take the injured to the local hospitals. The two did go back into the library where no one was except for Patrick Ireland, who was still unconscious, and Lisa Kreutz, who still couldn't move. At 12.02 p.m., the police shot through the library windows, and the fire was returned. Again, no one, no one else was hit. By 12.05 p.m., all gunfire in the school and the sh- school had stopped. 12.08 p.m., Eric had sat down with his back against the bookshelf and fired his shotgun through the roof of his mouth. Dylan then got down on his knees and shot himself in the temple with his Tech-9. In an article, according to the Rocky Mountain News, Patty Nielsen had overheard them shout one, two, three, and then she heard a loud boom. But Patty later said that she never spoke to either of the writers of the article, so we don't know for sure what they said or did in their final moments. The FBI know, but but we don't, because there is like there are cameras that were going off. Like they saw pretty much everything, so the FBI knows exactly what happened, most at least uh, exactly what physically occurred. But we don't know. The massacre is finally over. At 1 p.m., authorities had reported pipe bombs and two SWAT teams had entered the school at 1.09 p.m. and moved through each of the classrooms and finding hidden students, students and staff. At 12.15 p.m., students had put a sign in the window that said, quote, one bleeding to death in order to get medical personnel and police in the classroom. The one bleeding to death was Dave Sanders, the teacher that was shot in the neck and was being held by students in the science class, that guy. Police did at first fear that it was a ruse by the shooters, um, and then there was a shirt that was also tied to the doorknob. And at 12.30 p.m., it was spotted, and by 12.40 p.m., SWAT officers didn't get to the, did get to the room and evacuated the students and teachers, and they did call for a paramedic. Kevin Starkley and Aaron Hansey, the students that were helping Sanders, um, excuse me, Dave, didn't want to leave him behind. By 3 o'clock, SWAT had moved Dave into a storage room that was a lot more accessible for paramedics. When the paramedics arrived, they found out that Dave Sanders had no pulse and that he had died of his injuries in the storage room before he could get any medical care. He was the only teacher to die in the shooting. And if y'all remember Patrick Ireland, I keep on... I love that name, Patrick Ireland. He gained the name of Boy in the Window. Um, and he did regain and lose consciousness multiple times after being shot by Dylan. And he was paralyzed on one side, of, on his right side. He crawled to the library windows at 12.38 p.m. and he fell from the window and was supposed to fall into the arms of two SWAT members that were on the roof of the emergency vehicle. But instead of falling into the arms of the SWAT team, he fell directly onto the roof of the vehicle and made a giant pool of blood. And this was on live TV. The two SWAT members were actually criticized for letting Patrick drop more than seven feet to the ground. And rather than, you know, instead of having them try to lower him or like go inside the classroom or like just do something, break his fall even, they didn't do that. They were just like, um, jump out a window and see if we can catch you. Also, why only two? At least have three. 
So they were very heavily criticized for just letting this very injured 17-year-old, I think he was like 17, jump from a window. <laughs> I don't know. Lisa Kurtz was still in the library and was keeping track of time by the school bells. She did try to move, but every time she began to move, she became very lightheaded. By 3.22 p.m., Lisa was finally evacuated along with Patty Nelson, Nielsen, excuse me, Brian Anderson, and three, others, uh, three other library staff who were hidden in different rooms by the library. Officials did find the bodies of Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris at 3.30 p.m. By 4 o'clock, Sheriff John P. Stone had made an estimate of 25 total dead and 50 wounded, and then he said that the massacre was a, quote, suicide mission. Sheriff Stone said that the police were searching for the bodies of the shooters and that they had fears that they had used their pipe bombs um, to booby trap the corpses, including their own. At 4.30 p.m., the school was declared completely safe, but by 5.30 p.m., more officers were called in because they had found explosives on the roofs and in the parking lot. At 6.15 p.m., officials um, found a bomb in Dylan's car and in the, um, in the parking lot. Sheriff Stone then declared the entire school a crime scene. On the morning of April 21st, bomb squads did comb through the entire school, and by 8.30, the official death toll was 15. 14, uh, 14 deaths, including Dylan and Eric, and one teacher. And 20 students and one teacher were injured because of the shootings, and three more were injured by trying to escape from the school. By 11.30 a.m., the school had been officially cleared for officials to enter, and the investigation was under the way. Was underway. Thirteen bodies were still in the school, and the investigators uh, did uh, photograph the building. Yes, the bodies were left there overnight. I don't like it. I understand that it was a safety thing, but I don't like it. The bodies were removed from the school and taken to the Jefferson County Coroner's Office to be autopsied and identified. By 5.15 p.m., an official statement was released naming the 15 confirmed deaths and the 27 injuries related to the massacre. By April 22nd, the cafeteria bombs were found. I don't know how you can come to school and then not, not find bombs in the cafeteria, because who just leaves duffel bags? I mean, I get it. There's okay, maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay, there's there's sports students that probably use duffel bags, and all the I'm pretty sure like a whole bunch of backpacks were left. Uh, so you know that makes sense. You know, I take back my statement. I'm sorry. In the days after the shooting, Rachel Scott's car and John Tomlin's truck did become memorials, and a whole bunch more were held at Clement Park. On April 30th, a carpenter, a carpenter named Greg Zanis made 15 six-foot-tall wooden crosses in honor uh, to honor those who had died. But Daniel Robro's uh, father, I think I'm saying his name right, um, but Dan one of the Daniel's dads uh, did cut down the two that were meant for Dylan and Eric, and there was also 15 trees planted for the dick for the victims, and then he also cut two of those down as well. So Rachel Scott and Cassie Bernal were regarded as Christian martyrs by the Evan the Evangelic the en, en, hang on, I will get this. En, the, I'm going with evangelical Christians. <laughs> Um, and they were Christian churches that used this whole martyr thing of Rachel and Cassie's death in order to promote themselves and recruit members. For some fucking reason, they thought a school shooting was a good advertising opportunity. Besides that, there was some doubt that there was act that they were actually martyrs because, well, for one, when Rachel Scott, um, she was the first one shot. The person next to her, uh, Richard Castaldo. Uh, at first did say that Eric had asked her if she believed in God, and after saying, quote, you know I do, Eric kills her. But after a little bit um, and being questioned about it again, it, Richard wasn't so sure that that actually happened. There was also a lot of media attention on Cassie and her interaction about God with Eric. If you remember, the girl next to her, Emily Wyant, did say this exchange never happened. There are some people that were in the area when Cassie was shot that said maybe this interaction could have happened, but they couldn't remember for sure. And I also just need to put this part in here, because it's, but it's actually crazy that someone said this, but it is the Westboro Church, so it makes sense. So the founder and leader at the time, Fred Phelps, is quoted saying, quote, two filthy fags slaughtered 13 people at Columbine High, end quote. 
and he said that they were both gay, and though he did later retract the statement, um, that's not okay. In fact, these churches, I don't have anything against religion, you do you, I'm agnostic, like, I don't care. But the fact that these churches took this tragedy and either used it as an opportunity to promote themselves, or would come with, with, oh, the reason that they killed all of those teens was because they were angry and gay. Which had nothing to do with anything. You're allowed to be angry about the situation. I, If you're not angry, that's weird. You know, this is a really fucked up situation. You know, but you're not allowed to throw another group of people under the bus publicly because of your opinion, okay? <laughs> okay, I know. I'm sorry. I haven't really been like... I know I haven't been saying much, and I even put it in the beginning that I probably won't be, and I'm actually saying a lot more than I thought I would, um, you know, just because there is a lot, it is hard to talk about, you know, just be lighthearted, I am trying my best, but it is really hard to try to, you know, add comedy without sounding disrespectful or sounding like I'm being flippant about the situation, because I'm not being flippant about it whatsoever, it, I just, this is just how I cope with the horrible things I choose to talk about, I'm literally doing this to myself, and I'm doing it to you guys. I'm going to stop talking and Daphne rent over and I'm going to keep talking about something else now. So for the last three weeks of the school year, classes were held, for some reason, at the nearby uh, Chatfield Senior High. In August of 1999, students did go back to school and they did have a rally where they all wore We Are Columbine shirts. And unfortunately, there were some people that did die after the shootings. Six months after the massacre, Anne Marine Hulk Halter's mom did end up killing herself. Greg Barnes, who was a 17-year-old student that did see uh, Dave Sanders get shot, ended up killing himself as well in May of 2000. Austin Eubanks, who I mentioned, um, did get injured in the shooting, ended up developing an opioid addiction before being heavily medicated. And he did end up overcoming this addiction, but he did die of an accidental overdose in 2019 at the age of 37. And, you know, of course, a lot of students and teachers do suffer from PTSD to this day. So we are going to start going into the motives behind this whole thing, or at least the theories behind um, why Eric and Dylan did this. So the shooting was planned to be a terrorist attack, and, you know, and this terrorist attack would cause the most deaths in U.S. history by terrorist attack. And, you know, and this was before 9-11 happened. Um, but there was, like, never for certain, without a doubt, this is the... T- like, this is the reason these two did this thing. Um, and But there are theories. So the FBI has a theory, of course, um, that Eric and Dylan did have mental illnesses, Eric being clinically psycholic, psychotic. Sorry, I've been talking for so long to the point where I can't even speak. Um, and Dylan was just being depressed. There is a quote from Dwayne Dusler who was in charge of the investigation where he said, quote, I believe Eric went to the school to kill and didn't care if he died, and Dylan wanted to die and he didn't care if others died as well, end quote. So the FBI did go through the two's journals, as I mentioned way back in the beginning. Dylan's journal did contain a lot of Dylan just wanting to kill himself because he wasn't having a very good track re- record with women, and he was on, and he was just honestly over it and just wanted to die. He was not happy. He couldn't get a girlfriend. He was just over life. And in one of the basement tapes, I think the last basement tape they ever made, I think it was 30 minutes before they drove to the school and began to do everything. The last thing he said was, quote, just know I'm going to a better place. I don't, I didn't like life very much, end quote. So the FBI's total theory is that Eric was the master, the master, the mastermind. Why can't I say that? The mastermind behind all of this and that he had this messianic level superiority complex and that he was going to demonstrate said superiority to the world by doing this whole crazy thing and that Dylan was simply a follower and he knew this is how he was going to die and he was just so ready to do so that he didn't care how it happened he just wanted it to happen and obviously there is a few problems with this theory one Dylan was the first to mention any sort of attack and Eric was also on antidepressants thus Eric also being depressed So he didn't just do this because of a superiority complex. Bullying is another theory that most have and kind of gravitate to. A lot of people said that not long after the, um, a lot of people have said after the shooting had just happened. Um, the school admin and teachers did condone the jocks, quote unquote, I hate that word jocks. No one actually says that. 
um, but the jocks would bully a lot, and the admin te- the admin and teachers didn't really do anything about it. Eric and Dylan were regularly called faggots a lot. When talking to Eric's father, he said, quote, they sure give Eric hell, end quote. Eric was also born with a minor chest indent, so whenever he had to change for gym class or, you know, just whenever he had to take his shirt off around people, specifically at school, other students would laugh at him. Eric and Dylan's friends had also recalled that a, quote, cup of fecal matter was thrown at them at one point. That's just fucking gross. Also, at one point, Eric and Dylan were sprayed with uh, ketchup by a group of students as they were called faggots and queers. Dylan was also pelted with ketchup-covered tampons. And according to Brooks Brown, um, that was friends with Eric, uh, this all happened while teachers watched. They couldn't fight back. They wore ketchup all day and they went home with it, end quote. I'm going to say this right now. I'm not trying to excuse or justify any of what Eric or Dylan's actions or the shooting. I'm simply just trying to have y'all see this on all sides. And again, these are just theories for motives for why they did this massacre. That is all I am doing. Not justifying anything. I'm not excusing anything. I'm just simply putting it out there that that is a thing that happened. There are many, many, many more theories. I will not be talking about all of them, but they range from the sort of medication they were on to Marilyn Manson to video games. So it's all sorts of crazy things for why these two did what they did. Um, so you guys are more than welcome to read into those theories. Um, but it's I'm already like an hour at this point, and I know that's a lot longer than um, I usually do. So there have been many memorials for the victims, as I said before, Rachel Scott's car and John Tomlin's truck were used as a memorial. In 2000, Melissa Hembright um, organized a remembrance event in Oregon with two of the survivors that were called a hope um, that were called a call to hope. A majority of the library was removed and replaced with an atrium, and in 2000, the now called the Hope Memorial Library was built next to one of the entrances. The victims were 17-year-old Rachel Scott, 15-year-old Danny Roborough, 47-year-old William David Sanders, 16-year-old Kyle Velasquez, 14-year-old Stephen Kernow, 17-year-old Cassie Bernal, 18-year-old Isaiah Scholes, excuse me, 16-year-old Matthew Ketcher, 18-year-old Lauren Townsend, 16-year-old John Tommel, 16-year-old Kelly Fleming, 15-year-old Daniel Monsier, and 17-year-old Corey DePooter. If you or a loved one are experiencing suicidal thoughts, please call 800-273-8255. That is 800-273-8255. And if you or a loved one are experiencing bullying, please text HOME, that is H-O-M-E, to 741741. And both of these outlets do have 24-hour, uh, 24-7 support. And that is all I have for you guys this week. My mouth hurts. That that was a rough one. I, oh my gosh, it was a lot. It was. I'm gonna finally breathe. I'm gonna stop walking in eggshells now. Just um, I didn't really know much about the shooting, and I had like a weird phase when I was younger where I did nothing but watch videos, and I just wanted to learn everything that I could about Columbine, and I don't know why, and I didn't retain any of it, I guess. Um, but I also just. This was a hard episode like this. Like it was hard for me specifically. Um, I didn't go through a school shooting like that. I didn't. I got lucky enough to not ever have to go through that. But I was in high school when um, a lot of school shootings were happening, like in the peak. I can't I think it was like 2017, 2018, if I remember correctly. It was kind of like the height where we would hear about different school shootings almost weekly, you know, and uh, I had almost forgotten about the fear that we, or at least I had, I'm not sure if I would, I'm sure everyone else was fine, but I just expect the worst things to always happen. But you know, I just kind of like, I would go to school and be like, what if today's the day? You know, like, so it it does hit home a little bit, but also since my mom was supposed to go there, it is a little scary. Um, So this episode was hard. I think it's going to be hard for all of you guys. Um, I did try my best to try to keep it as lighthearted, but also like, it's it's hard to balance um, really fucked up things that happened and then try to 
add some comedy in there just to keep it as lighthearted as possible, but without being disrespectful. And I feel like I am getting better at that. Um, I don't like to recommend my very early episodes just because I do say some crazy shit. Just because I, you know, I was younger. I didn't really know. Um, I'm not excusing anything. I don't think I said anything like horrible, but I don't feel like I went about saying some things the correct way. And I don't have any examples on the top of my head because I literally refuse to listen to any episodes prior to season two. And even then, I just refuse to listen to my episodes. I literally hate my voice. Um, where was I going with this? I don't know. I just keep talking and I just want to stop talking. <laughs> anyway, so Dylan's mom, Sue Klebold, did do a TED talk about her story and just about how she felt. And, you know, just her story about being a mother of a school shooter. I will leave a link at the top of the description or the show notes or, or it's not going to be at the top. It's going to be where all my sources are because I do link my sources at the um, in every episode. So it's going to be the very first link that you guys will see. Um, or so if you can't seem to find it, because I know some of the things that I'm on are a little finicky when it comes to show notes, so you guys don't even see the description. Um, just type into YouTube, my son was a Columbine shooter, and it should be the first thing to pop up. Also, just let me know if you guys like the name Fricked History, or even if you like that I'm doing different things that aren't just true crime. I'm probably just going to keep doing it anyway. Um, because I like doing it, but just tell me that you also like me doing this, and I'll feel just a little validated. Let me know what y'all think of the comments, DMs, and the subreddit, etc. Check out the Patreon, where you guys get episodes out a week early, bonus episodes, and exclusive merch. My clothing store, my store where you can buy things such as clothing and decor, I think is pretty awesome, and I'm definitely learning on how to actually design things. So, if you checked it, like, a few months ago, and it was like, eh, um, check it again. There is a lot more better stuff on there. I definitely updated it. Um, I've updated it. It's I've spent a lot of my break working on it. So it looks the same, but systematically it's not. Um, but also use the codes uh, SWTF15 for 15% off your first purchase. And 25% of my monthly proceeds from the merch store and the Patreon do... I just call it the merch store because it's just easier than calling it the store. Um but 25% of my monthly proceeds from the store and the Patreon do go towards uh, foundations such as the DNA Donut Network and the Cold Case Foundations. So you can help me help the people get identified or their case finally solved so they can finally get the justice that they deserve. Hit that plus sign, follow, rate it five stars because that'll make me happy and you get an internet cookie. And make sure to share with your friends and family that call people jocks. I didn't really know what to say for that part. I didn't plan that. I don't know, share it with someone. Share, share it with a friend. I don't know. Share, share it with someone else that you also knew went through a weird Columbine phase when they were younger. Like, way too young to even really know what Columbine was. Share that with that person. Yeah. Be kind. Make decent decisions. And I'll see y'all next week with a brand new episode that will make you say, seriously, what the frick. Bye, y'all.